Welcome. Lovely Hello, to meet you. Doing? Great. Thank you for joining us. I didn't know if I was in a little early or if we're waiting for the rest of the team here. You're a tiny bit early, but that's fine. Um, well, no, actually, no, you're not. You're you're just on time. Everyone's just coming in. So um, I've heard a lot about you from from Dan. Um, oh no. Yeah. <laughs> and um, looking forward to to hearing more about your work. And I must admit, the the Finger Lakes as a region was only relatively quite recently on my radar. I'd heard about it through some wine colleagues, uh, Dr. Jamie Good, and of course, Dan. Um, I think it's, um, Dan's got some super wines um, from your region and his um, his wine uh, merchants, good wine, good people. Hi, Dan. Hi, Megan. Thank you for Hello. joining. So, well, let me let me introduce you and then I'm going to hand over to Dan to, to host this session. So um, I first met Dan uh, Belmont at an old vine conference, wine tasting. Um, and I, I think, can I say, Dan, I think you're such a, a great force for good in the wine industry. So great to have you in the UK wine trade. Dan's the founder and wine buyer for Good Wine, Good People, a really fantastic importer and online wine merchant, beautiful wines um, and beautifully communicated. He joined us very early on as a supporter of the old vine conference as a trade supporter which is so important to us we really want the trade to believe in the concept because without you the wines can't be sold um and um as as well as heading up good wine good people dan is also um one of the um advocates and um um a, a sort of an educator for the new york finger lakes um yeah. <laughs> so I know that Dan's going to be um, speaking with um, Megan, who's the vice president of Dr. Constantine Frank Winery, and Oscar, the co-owner of Herman J. Vima Vineyard. And um, they're going to talk about how essentially working in with New York Finger Lakes to create kind of old vines as a sort of a new category for, for the region. So um, I'll hand over to you. I'll be keeping an eye on the Q&A and the chat. And thank you so much for joining us. Uh, thank you, Sarah. And thank you, uh, everybody, uh, for joining us for, for the session today. Last one of the day, you made it. Uh, and uh, yeah, we've got a lot to share. So I'm going to I'm gonna dive right into it. Um, as Sarah said, I, I am New York born and raised. Uh, I, I live here in, in London now for many years, uh, where I operate Good Wine, Good People for the UK market. But uh, I've always... Um, used my experience with New York State wines as kind of a lens through which I see the rest of the wine world. Uh, Oscar, in fact, was the first person to hire me professionally uh, in the wine industry. Uh, and so I, I, I owe it all to you, buddy. Uh, mm -hmm. and, uh, <laughs> did I do that? Did I get remember? <laughs> yeah, yeah, that was you. I, I pestered you for, for quite some time. Uh, and so, um, yeah, I'm thrilled to be a part of the Old Vine Conference as, as a trade member with Good Wine, Good people. We, we stock over 90 uh, uh, wines that um, support old vine viticulture. Uh, we also uh, stock more New York state wine than any other retailer in the UK. Uh, not that that's a high bar to cross, but, but we're planting the flag early. Uh, and uh, last year in 2022, I rewrote the uh, reference guide for the New York state wine and grape foundation. So if you do want to learn more about uh, New York state uh, viticulture and the industry, uh, you can go to newyorkwines.org and you could find a, a handy dandy reference guide uh, that uh, I'm, I'm proud to pen. Uh, so, you know, many folks consider uh, New York's Finger Lakes region to be a young region. Uh, it's modern industry taking root in the 1970s. Uh, but prior to this, you know, native and hybrid varieties made up the majority of the plantings, uh, and many of those uh, original plantings are still around. Um, however, we have two of the kind of dedicated stewards of the vine here that are still farming uh, the earliest uh, vinifera plantings in the region. And we have Oscar from Herman Weimer and Megan Frank uh, from Dr. Constantine Frank. Now, I do expect there are some audience members here uh, unfamiliar with New York State viticulture in the Finger Lakes. So I want to hand it over to our guests uh, to do a very quick introduction. And, and while they kind of talk through that, I'm going to pull up uh, a map uh, and a few images to show you guys so we can uh, uh, learn a bit more and kind of visualize it. All right. Megan, should I, do you want me to, should I start here a little bit? Sure. Yeah, I can just jump okay. in. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. so um, 
thank you uh, everybody uh, for having us and um uh, going back to Sarah, the, for your first comment, uh, this is uh, the region is fairly new for for many people. We all are an up and coming region, but I, I think it's a lot to to as Dan is mentioning, uh, our communication and marketing of the new some of the newer wines are are new, but we've been established here for quite quite a while. And the map that's up here, you see Finger Lakes, the the area there in the middle. We are in New York, but we're quite far, almost uh, four or five hours drive west west of New York City, up towards the Canadian border, so almost closer to Niagara Falls. Uh, and so the the just quick uh, quick uh, rundown of this this area. If you look at the agriculturally, these are lakes that are long and narrow and very deep. Uh, we are fairly far north, but not so. It's a, a, a inland climate where you get rather warm summers, but devastatingly cold winters here towards, the, again, up north. So these lakes, you see Seneca Lake here, uh, is almost over 200 meters deep. So there, many of these lakes cannot freeze, uh, even if it goes minus 20 C, 25 C for weeks, uh, they won't freeze. And therefore, they will create a airflow and air exchange to moderate the climate around these lakes. So going back hundred, hundreds of years, hundred years, we have grown uh, hybrids and and uh, native varieties here. But in the sixties and seventies, you will see Dr. Frank Herman Weimer, um, European background. Uh, Herman was. Herman, Herman's father is from Barencastle. Herman's father was ran the experimental station uh, in, in Barencastle, starting to find the agricultural viable sites around these lakes where the lake will protect vinifera, which are more sensitive varieties. And it was really Dr. Frank who put the first vinifera in the ground here. And now, 40, 50 years later, we have found these sites uh, we are now in a generational shift where we are getting new materials that we're grafting and so forth in here. But it's because you see this uh, lake here. This uh, again, they will. They are the reason why we can grow then vinifera this far, far north. So that's the again the agricultural reason why we're, we're here. Yeah, I really like these two images as as visual aids for uh, the lake effect, both of the Finger Lakes, you know, particularly Seneca and Cayuga in the center of the image, but also uh, the Great Lakes to the north. Uh, and again, in an incredibly cold uh, winter, this was 2014, this image here, right. uh, uh, everything uh, froze over. You even have ice on the Great Lakes uh, up at the top of the image, uh, but Seneca and Cayuga didn't freeze over. And so they really act as uh, wonderful temperature moderators, uh, both in the winter and the summer months. That's right. So in the summer month, you will create an airflow where you then reduce the seas pressure and dry out the vineyards. Uh, while in the winter they protect and spring protect from spring frost and so forth. Yeah, I like this this image here. It's just a, 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 a visual to show that there really is uh, quite a bit of, of a viticultural history in New York State in the Finger Lakes. Uh, this ad is early 1900s uh, and referencing uh, uh, wine competitions going back to 1867 here uh, when we were making champagne. Uh, apologies <laughs> to all the uh, the French participants on our webinar today. <laughs> yeah. Yes, Megan, you you have a, you know a lot of the history here about this. <laughs> yeah, no, it's incredible. I mean, going back two hundred years, we have a heritage for producing wine in the Finger Lakes. But again, as you mentioned, Oscar, these varieties were the Vitis Labrusca, you know, Concord, Catawba, Niagara. So a very uh, long history pre-prohibition of producing, um, you know, a lot of wines coming out of the Finger Lakes region. Um, you know, this is actually a photo of my great grandfather's research. So Constantine, um, as Oscar mentioned, he was a researcher, had earned a PhD in viticulture in Odessa, Ukraine, and basically arrived here by chance. He was a World War II refugee, so arrived in New York. And at the time, the region was really focused on the American varieties, you know, Vitis Labresca varieties, and also the French-American hybrids. And there was just this communal thought 
that Vinifer was not going to survive our cold winters. And Constantine would say, there's no way, because in Odessa, he would say in the winter, your spit would freeze before it hit the ground, that it was so cold. And Vinifer survived. So the European variety survived. And he had a theory that it was due to the lack of proper rootstock, uh, cold hardy, phylloxera resistant rootstock. And that's what he really set out to do. Um, and that was that's really why here in the Finger Lakes, you know, we have some of the oldest vines actually in America, not just in the eastern United States, because um, from the beginning, a lot of our older vine plantings were planted on this phylloxera resistant cold hardy rootstock from day one. You know, so we have 65 year old plantings uh, that are still producing, you know, that are still very viable. Um, meanwhile, in California, you know, during the 1960s, there was an unfortunate recommendation to plant uh, grafting AXR1, you know, which is has a vinifera parent and is not phylloxera resistant. So, you know, decades passed, the, there was, you know, thinking of why the vineyards were, you know, um, not producing as much as they should out West. And they unfortunately had many had to be ripped out and replanted. Of course, the exception is uh, Old Vine Zinfandel, which was always planted on St. George rootstock. So um, getting back to the Finger Lakes, you know, this is why we have some of the really old, oldest plantings talking about Riesling, Pinot Noir, Chardonnay, uh, Gewürztraminer, uh, some all oddball varieties like Separavi and Ricazzatelli. You know, these are very, very uh, interesting kind of snapshots into our history. Um, and it's really because from day one, the grafting uh, was with the correct plant material. Excellent. Uh, why don't you guys talk a bit just about what the, the the plant material and the plantings that you guys are still working with today? Uh, just kind of give us an overview of, of what you have to play with. Uh, Oscar, do you want to go? Yeah, so mm -hmm. um, go back to a little bit what I mentioned here initially. So Herman's father uh, was in charge of the agricultural experimental station in Mosul, in Berncastle, and really helped uh, Mosul get back on track after the Second World War. Um, but so Herman then grew up in Mosul, uh, educated in in uh, in to get in Geisenheim, uh, when he came over here to America, he used the material from his father in Germany. So that's where the material came from. Uh, but also learning how to graft on the right rootstock here. So the, the material, the Chardonnay and the Rieslings, those are the old vines that we have, are really uh, coming then from Europe, uh, from originally. Um, we now have um, quite a lot of acreage with this, this, these vines, so 40 year old vines are, are producing and we're enjoying them, enjoying them quite well. On the other side, we also, again, we have a nursery today. So a lot of wineries in the, uh, not only in the Northeast, even on the West Coast, rely on us grafting vines, baby vines for them. So we are heavily involved in the development of grafting, uh, you know, matching rootstocks with the right Sions and and uh, soils and so forth, uh, and that's a completely new development today than it was then in the sixties and seventies, of course. Yeah. And Megan, how and about? I think you know, good. Nope, mm -hmm. no, I'm good. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we're very thankful for the Herman Weimer Nursery because we also use. <laughs> use you guys for uh for custom graphs so that's really useful because there there are certain we have our own uh rootstocks here that were planted by constantine um typically a blend of vitis repara vitis rupestris um and different rootstocks are going to be diff you know better for different soil types so we have a myriad of different soil types so really matching the right rootstock to the to the soil to the variety um, but in terms of our oldest planting you know, it's really like um, Oscar mentioned, you know, for us, it's Chardonnay, Riesling, and also Pinot Noir. So we have all three of those plantings going back to Constantine's first planting in 1958. Um, and then he planted continuously, you know, throughout the early 60s until his passing in 1985. And we've continued to, you know, continue to grow and plant additional acreage, but those are our oldest kind of plantings. Um, 
he had over 66 different grape varieties. So, um, so like Herman, we were very much into experimentation and carrying that through. And you have to remember during this time, there was no vinifera prior. So really figuring out what worked, what didn't, looking at a variety of rootstocks, variety of varieties, clones, and all the different iterations, which would eventually kind of lay the groundwork for where we are today, you know, 65 years uh, from that first planting. And we're still, you know, looking at new varieties. And I know, you know, at Herman Weimer, they're looking always at new, new grape varieties and seeing what's viable. So we've just started to kind of scratch the surface. But um, these clones, like we have for our Pinot Noir and our Chardonnay, we affectionately call them the Dr. Frank clone because it's the sort of origin and the exact clone number is sort of mysterious. You know, Constantine mm -hmm. had his network and he uh, spoke fluent French. So he was able to go out to the uh, experiment station in Quebec and receive plant material. Um, of course, in those days, not as uh, very strict quarantine laws. It was sort of a suitcase <laughs> cutting situation. Um, and this Dr. Frank clone is something we continue to propagate. So it's a really important, you know, tie to our history. And for me, you know, it's the only way I know my great grandfather. I never met him, but through these original plantings, I can sort of feel uh, closeness, you know, to him. So. Excellent. So to recap, we are working across both both um, uh, brands, Herman J. Weimer, Dr. Constantine Frank, Oscar, you guys are also uh, uh, stewards of the Standing Stone estate as well. And so plantings now 40, 50, even 60 years of age, right? And so I kind of want to talk uh, uh, a bit into viticulture itself. What are these vines telling us in terms of in terms of viticulture now uh how have they changed how they developed how do they react uh to our extreme uh kind of weather changes and in comparison to some of the newer plantings uh all right let's let's, let's see if i can answer some of those things <laughs> uh go back a little bit to um uh yes so if you look back when we grew uh uh, you know, uh, hybrids and, and uh, non-vinifera here, natives, they were planted and based on really make sure they produce, they produce a lot of yield per acre. And, you know, you had eight feet in between the vine, you know, two and a half meters in between the vines. So when vinifera was planted in the 60s and 70s, you had a mindset of uh, of the uh, hybrids and uh, and also native, so so some of our plantings that were planted early early on were almost managed like a like a hybrid. Uh, so there was less know how in those vines. So so for example, when we took over our Joseph vineyard uh, from Charles Fournier and who had planted that, a gentleman from Vaucliquot had planted that in the 70s, uh, they were not meant to produce then quality, more quantity. So what we have done with a lot of these old vines is to adjust them to the to the new world order, lowering yield, manage it completely different. And we have seen enormous quality changes, enormous quality changes. And I think now when May Megan and and Weimer and a few others are now seeing this shift on change of viticulture practices, uh, we are really enjoying these old vines uh, and what they do for us. Um, what we also are enjoying, which Megan mentioned, if if a vine can survive up in the finger lakes for 40, 50 years, mm -hmm. you have a completely different character. Even if a pe if a person can live there for so long, <laughs> you 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 have another identity and another personality. And therefore you have other, you refer to it to, to Dr. Frank clones and Weimer clones. But we've seen these vines uh, adjusting very well to our circumstances that we are. And obviously established root systems uh, is ha helping us a lot. Uh, when you see then uh, global warming and, and climate change coming at us, when you have mild winters, early springs, uh, rainy weather, uh, you will see these older vines handling it or not being concerned what's happening on the surface. You know, when the soils are heating up, they are not 
reacting as fast as young guys are, you know, this spring, uh, unfortunately, a devastating uh, frost that took away almost 30% of the of the vinifras in the Finger Lakes. It was had frost uh, May 18th, but the buds were out like this. So then you will see old vines being a little hardier for things like that. So we are now uh, promoting old vines. We see the value in old vines, but also, also marketing-wise, we are starting to promote and see the quality. You have old vines, Pinot Noir, we have a timeline, Riesling, and so forth. And, and as our market, we should also say that the wine market in America is changing fast. Uh, uh, and they are ready to receive uh, Rieslings of different levels of quality and mm -hmm. they are informed and so forth and so forth. So also our messaging and our communications to the to the visitors are also, we see that they enjoy these both of these stores and the qualities of the wines. Absolutely. I would just add too, in terms of viticultural practices, you know, in the region here, by and large, we're dry farmed. You know, we we don't really have irrigation lines set up. Um, I can just think of like one or two producers that have roots in California that just set them up because that's what they did, you know, back home. Um, and we've had droughts, you know, in the past 10 years, we've had two pretty significant drought years and the old vines, you know, weather that storm, you know. Uh, figuratively and, and physically, they really, they really do. Um, and we see virtually very little uh, issue, you know, during those drought years. And as Oscar, Oscar mentioned, you know, we had a horrible frost in, in May, unfortunately. So we're going to continue to see these fluctuations in weather. And for us here in the Finger Lakes, our sort of Achilles heel is the winter damage, the very cold winters we get. Um, and obviously we have the lakes to help moderate, you know, that on Cuca Lake, we're not quite as deep as over on Seneca Lake. So we, we can sometimes have freezing, which, which is, causes, you know, a big issue. But a really important viticultural practice that we do um, that was introduced by Constantine is, is something called hilling up, which is widely practiced, you know, throughout the, the region today. And it's basically hilling up a foot of soil to protect the graft union, the most vulnerable portion of the vine. And that really helps to kind of um, make sure that these older vine plantings can survive, that you won't have vine damage. You know, the worst that could happen would be, be maybe bud damage, which just would affect, you know, that, that year's crop. Uh, whereas vine damage is obviously very significant and it would require years, you know, of, of time prior to, to getting crop, a crop again. So, uh, very important. This is a plow. This is a photo of actually Constantine in Odessa. He managed a very large estate there. And he put three tractors together and connected a plow, which would take hundreds of people many weeks to do by hand. You can imagine putting handfuls of soil, it's like crazy. And some of the vineyards they actually buried entirely. So this practice, you know, was widely used in Europe in very cold regions. And uh, it's something that really helps protect these older vine plantings today in the Finger Lakes as it relates to vinifera. Uh, and just to add a little bit to Megan is saying, you will see when you drive around Finger Lakes that although if you have an old vine, as you may, on top, above the union, the graft union, you might not have the, you know, the, because because of this cold winter could have, you can have split canes and, and, and so forth. So above the union, you might have a younger vine that's underneath the union, you have an older plant. So, so in some of these places where you don't have winter damage, you see bigger trunks. And in other places, even if they have the same same age on the vines. I think yeah. I have a good uh, a visual image of what you're talking about here, Oscar. I think, um, right, Megan, that this was one of your- mm -hmm. Yeah, this is one of our Ricazzatelli plantings, but you can see how large the trunks are. So that acts as sort of a carbohydrate reserve uh, to help kind of weather, you know, the many, many years. Uh, and also the root system obviously goes, as Oscar mentioned, goes very- deep down into the subsoil, picking up trace elements, you know, that younger vines can't reach yet. Uh, Oscar, at Herman J. Weimer, you guys have pushed uh, viticulture uh, 
to the to the max uh recently demeter certified uh with yeah. some of your plots and you guys uh chose to practice biodynamics starting in 2015 uh mm -hmm. and you chose some of your your oldest plantings for for this what i imagine you, you would probably call an experiment in the beginning right now it's seems like practice for you guys but uh tell us just a little bit about that that kind of journey and what was about those blocks that that said we could do this yeah, you know what? I, I might not be able to give you an, an answer exactly that's easy because we don't know, <laughs> Dan. <laughs> Thank you. We Good. just don't know. <laughs> what happened is that in do that we have we have these on the original it's our 33 acres uh under vine here around the winery itself that's uh, Demeter certified, so we go fully biodynamic. But it started only in five acre plot that we then wanted to see how biodynamics could be could be managed in the circumstances that we are under and then we have gradually gone from five into then 33 acres um initially we started with young vines that um that we saw started from the beginning to to handle with biodynamic management and they reacted quite well now recently we've gone into our old vines and We've had actually mixed results, uh, to be quite frank, to see. But it seems like some of the old vines, just because they are weathered, uh, they tend to handle the conversion better uh, from, from being organic or more conventionally farmed into, into uh, biodynamics. But we also have to say it's been a very gradual process. We, we stopped using herbicides here 15, 16 years ago. And we've always been uh, fairly uh, sensitive to to what we use in the vineyards. Uh, so, but we see, I think any any, you know, I think it's low yields and uh, and so forth that also helps the conversion into biodynamic, which might give you thicker skins and looser clusters, uh, which then tend to be an aspect of old vines. But it's very difficult to say, Dan, if specifically if these older vines are uh, doing it better just because they're old. <laughs> so, so I don't know if that's a, that's a vague, vague answer to that. But we see that we, we again we're enjoying uh, enjoying the fruit of of the biodynamic efforts here. We do uh, mainly actually in the cellars. We, we're noticing that uh, the the must and the juice. Uh, how it ferment the 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 yeast culture, how healthy that is. That's that's really where where we see the result of this. Uh, Megan Oscar said earlier uh, that you know the American market is is more open to uh, is becoming more open to premium styles of riesling uh, and and interested in essentially heritage viticulture and and I know you guys have have you know labeled at least I, I'm very familiar with your Pinot Noir as an old vines Pinot Noir for some time uh, is that uh, your experience as well is that what you're looking forward to for the future is continuing to kind of push consumers towards heritage viticulture for all of its benefits and 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 wonders <laughs> yeah so I like the wonders <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And, you know, for us too, we have one of our single veneered Rieslings um, is from a black. It's named after my great grandmother, Eugenia, from 1968. And to be able to tell that story, um, you know, that this black was planted with Constantine and Eugenia, and it's named after her. Um, and the reason why we, you know, started this project with our Helm series line of wines which is basically paying tribute to the women of our family who have helped build the business is because we vinify every block separately, you know? So right now I was just testing our fur vents. We have 80 fur vents going on and it's just like mayhem. <laughs> and uh, we, we saw this, it was, it's called section eight, the section eight, which is our now Eugenia black was just always had this really distinct character um, you know, when it was fermented dry, very mineral focused, um, like linear precision. And, uh, you know, six years ago, I decided we need to vinify, we need to do this separate. And I think you're going to see a lot, a lot of producers moving in that direction with really special kind of heritage blocks. Um, and to communicate that to, to a guest, to a consumer, 
it's funny, you know, you say it's went to 1968 and you have someone say, oh, that's the year I was born. That's not old. You know, so there is like a very funny, you know, situation where we start talking about old vines and oldest blacks being from 58. They're like, that's not old. You know, I'm in my 60s. So um, I think just communicating, you know, the benefits uh, and the really interesting facts about these old vine blacks is is something we do, you know, daily in our tasting room. I'm sure Oscar does, you know, the same at Herman Weimer. It's just to to be able to to talk about this and have uh, this as an interesting um, connection, you know, for visitors. I think that's it's going to be a bright future for for that regard. Yeah. And as as Sarah mentioned initially here, first up, I, I've just started to hear about you guys in the Finger Lakes, and uh, that is, you're not the only one uh, we've seen over the last decade an exponential increase in tourism and interest and attention in wine media internationally and nationally. So that gives us a platform to tell our story, while maybe twenty years ago is it, is it sweet or not sweet. <laughs> <laughs> and right. then you know and so now now we are again have a completely different audience which we are enjoying which really then adds to uh, the 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 development of the region so yeah that's what's going so, on um at the risk of making you um sort of hate me a little bit when I first joined the wine trade and I was in my 20s so you know 25 years ago and I was doing my first wine course at the WSET in London, I remember the section on New York wines, and it was basically, well, you know, they make wine, but it's all terrible. (laughs) (laughs) Don't even think about it. You know, it's heroic, terrible wine. Um, And um, and Even going back, even going back seven, eight years when I did WSET, the, the New York State section in the book, you could it was that big i mean and and luckily we've we've grown and we're seeing other kind of uh resource materials like the world atlas of wine and uh the oxford companion start to really kind of uh, uh tell our story better and just in the 14 years from when i was first introduced to the to the finger lakes and to new york viticulture it's a completely different landscape now yeah, uh, and, and it's one of the reasons i love it because i'm never bored and yeah. you know and i think that you know, um, first of all, thank you so much for all your, you know, your presentations. You've been so direct and transparent and um, I've, it's been so engaging. And, you know, what um, I was thinking is that although what you were saying, Megan, about how some of your guests may think, come on, this vine is as old as me. Don't call it old. I think <laughs> that the by the, the the old vine mentality isn't looking backwards it's about a certain continuity of thinking mm. and a long-term thinking which means that you're rooted in place um and you're rooted in community and you're basically thinking in terms of deep value continuity you're there for the long haul and that comes with all sorts of commitments but also benefits um and so i think that even though in terms of old vine um kind of um potential you might think that you're on the younger side of things by being able to use this old vine lens to talk about your heritage i think it's really compelling um and we see this again and again with with regions um all over the world um we've got a couple of questions Uh, which I'd like to put to you. So Hannah Aldgate. Hi, Hannah. Um, She says, I understand that some old vine non-vinifera stroke hybrids in Finger Lakes that are there. Although there is a focus on vinifera, are these non-vinifera old vines also being considered for their potential? I mean, I'll, I'll jump in. Absolutely. Um, you know, I think, uh, <laughs> um, yeah, I think that, that these sites are there. I mean, I think that uh, as we continue to kind of focus heavily into sustainability and long-term thinking for the future, we we are paying more and more attention to these heritage hybrid heirloom varieties. And those ones that are still there from very early plantings uh, are showing the the best fruit, really. I mean, and the best best uh, opportunities to to push that quality level for hybrids and vinifera. So I can come up 
come up with the off the top of my head three four wines featuring uh, uh, hybrids and native varieties from old vine vineyards uh, and just due to the kind of nature of these grapes and their flavor profile they're made into pretty fun wines right we're not you know they're they're not they're not taken to terribly seriously we're talking pet nats and, and things like yeah. that um, but you know when you look at the um, less uh, tractor influence that you require to to manage these vineyards, the less spraying that you require to manage these vineyards. Uh, I think that's where we're really seeing the benefit, and we're going to continue to see increased production. And I think perhaps the yeah. rise in consideration for sort of peewee varieties and the yes. of sustainability yeah. has actually helped these non-vinifera varieties. Um, I've just seen also that Rebecca Miles Steiner in the chat has asked a similar question. I believe that today both Dr. Frank and Vama produce mostly vinifera wines. Um, are you familiar with any old vines of non-vinifera varieties in the Finger Lakes? So um, the answer is yes, you are. Yeah. And, yeah. yeah. and Sarah, what you were saying here about we're keeping a close eye to on, on the peewee varieties uh, and also the crossings that were made the 40s and 50s based on again quantity cold resistance and so forth while modern research in these crossing are more you know taste profiles and so forth so there's a lot of development happening in that area also but as dan's saying there's some numerous examples of very good ways or ver version of making excellent sparkling wines uh, from these varieties. So yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I just have one one ad. I was speaking with our assistant winemaker this morning and we were talking, he has, uh, his family has a grape farm that goes back to, you know, the 1880s, something like that. And uh, he was telling me they have a hundred year old Concord planting. And I was like, what do you do with, with those Concord, you know, grapes? And he's like, oh yeah, we sell them to Welch's. I'm like, oh my God. So I think that in this discussion of old vines, I think that that gives also, um, you know, a, a bit of breath and excitement maybe towards these overlooked older vine plantings of other species. I think there's an opportunity, you know, um, because we have these very, very old plantings uh, of these other varieties as well. Yes, very well put. Um, yeah. A final comment in the chat from Ulda. He says, having just been to Seneca Lake a couple of weeks ago, I can say that the Rieslings are reaching very impressive heights these days. Ah, uh, good to hear. <laughs> Thank you. And I, I think um, just to sort of loop that back into the old vine perspective, that you know, just that in term, there's not it's not just about genetic diversity. I think that also by taking this old vine lens, it allows us to expand idea, our ideas of the ways in which wine can be beautiful and compelling and authentic. And I think that that expansion of possibility and imagination is, is so important for wine. Um, and um, I'm so, oh, that's my timer to remind myself not to talk too much. But I'll tell you, if that excites you, then New York <laughs> State is a perfect place to do a deep dive into. Mm -hmm. that kind of okay, and, old vine field trip kind of to New York State. And, and, you know, <laughs> pushing the limits and and, 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 and trying new things and, and trying old things. That's, that's what we're all about. Thank mm -hmm. you. Yeah. Well, thank you all so much. I'd just like to extend my thanks to very important people, all of our guests and attendees today. Um, I know that um, we've had quite a few people dip in and dip out, but we've had a, a really sort of solid hardcore of about 80 people who've essentially been with us all day. So thank you so much. Um, tomorrow we have our, our second uh, session and we'll be hearing from great speakers from all over the world including um, Australia. Um, we also have a session with the IWSC, Clément, great cooperative in Gascony, some of the oldest vineyards in the world, South Africa, Italy, um, Australia, and California. Dan, thank you so much for your amazing support and for coming to talk to us about these wines and also Oscar and Megan, 
um wonderful I, I must get some of your wines I guess I can order them from you Dan yes I from Dan I'd like to thank all of our guest hosts and um and our regional ambassadors and an enormous thank you to my amazing colleague Belinda Stone who hasn't appeared on video but really whose efforts yeah. and diligence and creativity have made this conference happen um so thank you so much and um come back tomorrow we will also be recording and publishing just in case you can't make it thank you bye for now thank you so much <laughs> bye. thank you thank you bye, bye. thank you